Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco for Sky and Telescope Magazine. If you've seen any of our interviews in the past with telescope manufacturers at places like the Northeast Astronomy Forum in New York or the Advanced Imaging Conference in California, today we're doing something a little bit different. Today we're in Rancho Dominguez, California, headquarters for plane wave instruments. This year, plane wave is celebrating its 10th anniversary. From its start in 2007, the company has grown to become one of the premier manufacturers of telescopes used for imaging and research around the world. There are hundreds of plane wave instruments in places as simple as backyard observatories and as advanced as mountaintop research facilities. So today we're gonna to get to see not only the telescopes, but we're getting a rare behind the scenes look at how they're made and the technology behind these fantastic instruments. I'm really looking forward to this today. I want to okay. see how all of these telescopes are made and all of your te great technology. It's great to have you here. I'm with Rick Hedrick, President and CEO of Plane Wave, who's going to give us our exclusive tour today through the facility. So, where do you want to start? Um, well, I'll give you a quick uh, overview here. This is our assembly area where we assemble the optical tubes. This is a 12 and a half. This is our inventory area where we keep all the inventory for the 12 and a halfs. Over here is our area for the 17s and we have all the inventory. This is where optics and everything are installed. This is a 14 over here also. And this is the 20 inch area. <clears throat> you can see some 20 inch telescopes in uh, various states of assembly. And over here we have a 24 being assembled. This is the mirror mounted in the back plate. Um, there's a secondary mirror over here. Um, so this will be assembled shortly. So this is the area where we make our smaller telescopes, anywhere mm -hmm. from the 12 and a half up to the 24. We also have some larger telescopes, um, which we have over here, we can take a look at. All right, you've got one very special one that we're going to take a look at yeah, today. Yeah, we have the, the, new, the new big big boy. All right. <laughs> so let's All take right. a look at that. All right, let's go. So this is the one meter. Yep, yep, this is, this is it. This is a, um, you know, you know, our newest project. We've been working on it for the last several years. All right. It's and impressive to stand next to it, that's <laughs> for sure. It is. It, it's, it's, <clears throat> and it's really very related to the CDK 700, which we have right over here. And, um, you know, because it's direct drive motors, just like the 700s, dual Naismith focus like the 700. So it's all things that we have perfected with the 700, um, and we've taken it up to here. But of course, as you get bigger, you know, things get a lot more difficult. So there's, a, you know, the, it was a long project that took kind of our whole team, you know, spending literally years, you know, going through the design of every step of the process. All right. And it all started with the primary mirror. We knew we wanted direct drive motors. We knew we wanted, you know, that and dual nasal focus, that we knew. But to make a big telescope and not have it weigh a ton um, is, or multi-tons. Multi-tons. <laughs> multi-tons, right, is, um, is a lightweighted mirror. So the whole first thing that we really designed and nailed down was the mirror design. All right, and the mirror in this weighs how much? It weighs 120 pounds. So it's a one meter mirror, 85 millimeters thick, and it has you know, light weighting pockets all through it, and right. it's fused silica. I know in a little while <laughs> we're gonna see one of these mirrors in the optical shop. Yeah. I'm gonna step you back for a second. You mentioned the Naismith focus. Yes. So it's a Cassegrain type system, but the focus can be put out either side. Yeah, this side or the other side. There's a mirror um, in here. In fact, we might be able to slew this down a little bit. Could you do that, Shelby? You slew this down here, and you can see that there is, here's the baffle, there's a, a, a flat mirror in here, M3, which right now is pointed to this Naismith port. Can you rotate it? So here it is rotating. So one thing that's nice about that is you can have a camera on one port, a different camera or a spectrograph on the other one, and switch between instrumentation in a matter of seconds. Right. And the other nice thing is if you happen to put an eyepiece on it, which a lot of universities might do, or even you know uh, any, anybody may, you, you, big telescope like, like this, you'd love to look through an eyepiece. Yeah. Is it's always at one height. <clears throat> so as you're rotating around, you know it's always at the same height. Uh, the 700 was designed to be at wheelchair height. <clears throat> this obviously is, is a little taller. No, the other nice thing is as you add instruments, you're not changing the balance of the telescope. So you can add, you're changing, you know, with, with uh, equatorial type telescopes or telescope that 
a Cassegrain, when you add weight to the back, you have to rebalance the telescope. This oh. doesn't change the balance at all. All right. And with a Naismith focus setup like this, as you're tracking as an altazimuth, you need to rotate the camera. That's correct. And, and that's all part of the system. It's all built in. That's right. It's built into the telescope. In fact, um, Shelby, if you could rotate it that way. Um, Dennis, step aside a little bit. Okay, so here we have a derotator, and the derotator on the one meter is a direct drive motor, just like the telescope is. So I can grab it, and oh, I can almost move it, but I can't <laughs> quite move it. But anyways, uh, Shelby, if you go ahead and rotate it. So it's the same drive that really drives the 700 right there. And this whole so, plate is the focus plate. And this whole plate is the focus. So Any, anything that you want to mount on there that can be put That's in there. Correct. The other thing that um, I think you had asked about was when the M3 hits a stop. Let's back away and rotate back this way. <clears throat> about like that's good. <clears throat> so the M3, when it rotates, it hits a hard stop. And you hear it, you know, uh, hit, hit it stop. It is alignable on each axis. So we set the rotation alignment. It, there's a hard stop we hit. And then we also set the, the tip. I mean, it's essentially, you barely have to adjust it at all, but to make collimation perfect, you know, you, you can have a slight adjustment, yet we only have one motor to move two things. And so what we do is we run up against a stop, and we have a magnet that pulls it to the stop. Oh. And that's why when it lands, you hear kind of you hear grab. It clunk. Yeah, it kind of clunks in hard. So maybe you can rotate one more time, and we'll see if we can hear the clunk. <laughs> So this M3 mechanical design, rotation mechanical design, we did on the CDK 700 first. And it's been a very robust, good design. Everything stays aligned well. And it's one of the more, every once in a while you come up with clever ideas. And it was a pretty clever idea to use magnets and be able to do it all with one motor. And I remember we spent, it was like a full day in meetings just throwing ideas out that almost worked but didn't work. I imagine there's many aspects of these telescopes that were designed and created the same way. You had a problem, you had to sit down, figure out how to solve them, and come up right. with a solution. Yeah, and it's fun. The, uh, sometimes it's not something you think about as what we think is a clever idea. Like some of the simplest things, you know, felt like the most clever idea that no one else is doing. And some things, you know, that look really complicated, we're like, oh, that's just, you know, regular engineering. But it's like our expansion joints, I think, were very clever. I think using 3D printing for the big baffles is a clever idea. Yeah, now and that's an interesting point, because as you look at these things, you can see that they're cone-shaped, and these are done with 3D printers. Right, right. So we had to get a big 3D printer. The nice thing is these are low quantity, and you can make, with a 3D printer, you can make whatever shape you want. It's very difficult when you're machining. And the, you, can get the, you can get bafflets in here or little baffles inside there that you cannot make you know, with machining, at least not easily. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think this, this was a very clever idea. We started doing on the 14-inch telescope first, I believe. All right. So all the telescopes are lending, you know, things we learn or create on different telescopes, you know, filter into all the rest of them. So. And there's a lot here in the one meter that then is, we're going to take and filter down in um, other new products. So one got, of them we'll look at later. Here. So you've got technology which is trickling down from the one meter yeah. and stuff in the one meter which has trickled up from the smaller scopes. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, definitely. All right. So you mentioned the engineering. Um, what's the story behind this unusual looking space frame that's uh, part of the uh, Altazimuth mount? Yeah, that's a great story. Um, you know, we were actually at NEF when uh, Kevin and I were um, discussing it. and. The issue is anybody who builds forks knows that you know, getting the two fork tines and the two axes to point to each other is a real big problem. Yeah. And I remember my days at Celestron fighting those battles. And you know, the 700, you know, when you weld two pieces, you know, big steel, stainless steel plates is what those are made of, and then you uh, um, paint it, put it in a, heat it up for painting, the whole thing moves. And you gotta bend the thing back and you have to build in adjustments on the pieces that are holding the bearings. So it's very difficult. And as we were talking about building the one meter, we thought the problem would just be worse because it's going to be bigger. Um, so we came up with the idea that, uh, well, what if we did space frame, you know, like these truss poles instead? Because what we could do is we could set these plates in place on a jig so that we know they're true to each other and true to this base. And then we can, um, 
you know, basically glue the truss poles in place. You take the truss pole, you have one side that has the uh, adhesive here, and it's um, just and it cures in place. So then this is set, uh, you know, very true to the actually the jig, and um, and there's no stress built into this uh, structure. So it's a very rigid, unstressed structure. Uh, whereas when it's welded parts, everything's very stressed. Right, stuff wants to so move around. So it means that you set these things down and you're aligned. Perfectly aligned. Yeah. So then we get axes all aligned. All right. Something that I didn't ask in the beginning, this is the same CDK design that's been used throughout your entire telescope line, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we started off with the 20 inch, we went to the 12 and a half, and then the 17, I believe. Um, and then I think we did the 700. Um, but yeah, it's all the same CDK design. They're all slight variations of each other. Um, there's not an exact scale of the design. Like this is an F6 system, the 700 is F6.5. As Morgs were trying to get the back focuses where we want, and um, but but yeah, they're all the CDK design. We've also made we make RCs also, but most customers when we start talking with them, they realize that the CDK is actually the right answer for yeah. them. You mentioned direct drive motors in the scope. Tell me a little bit more about those. Yeah, so um, we started direct drive motors with our 700. The a direct drive motor is there's no gears in the telescope. The, the, this, like the, the azimuth axis is actually sitting on top of a motor with an absolute encoder, a high resolution encoder as its feedback. And so there's no gears in here. So if I push on the telescope, here I'll push on the telescope, Ugh! and it'll go exactly back to where it was and I'm not hurting anything. Right? So there's no gears to, to, be, to get hurt. There's no uh, gears to wear out over slewing, you know, there's, there's a big bearing in there. The bearings are meant to be used on machines that are rotating very fast for many years. You know, even if we slew every <laughs> night and go to, you know, try and image every star, you know, you're not gonna come close to wearing out the bearings. The only moving parts that touch are the bearings. And here's another example of direct drive. And then, in fact, Shelby, if you could turn off the, so here it is disabled. Oh, oh look at so that. Here you can see it. Look, look, you know, just yeah. fingertip control, yeah. yeah. Fingertip movement. Yep. And then all you have to do is hit enable, and then boom, we're back enabled. Now it's now it's live again. So the other advantage is without having gears. In in a gear train, the like say a, a worm gear, which we make our A two hundred is worm gears. Um, the interface between the gear and the worm is a place where you uh, lose rigidity. Right, because there's any yep. amount of slop yep. allows for movement and takes away from stiffness. So a direct drive motor is very stiff, because I mean, you know, you bang the telescope, and there's you're not banging against anything. There's nothing that's loose in it. It's, yep. it's just the motor. You're sitting right on top of the motor, so they end up being very stiff, and with a nice fast servo loop, um, you can actually counteract wind gusts to some extent, and. Uh, you know, I've made a lot of mounts throughout my career, um, but the direct drives are just by far the stiffest. They're so easy uh, because you don't have this gear interface. You don't have little bearings holding a worm, you know, that sees the whole load of the telescope when you bump it, when the wind bumps it, yep. you know. Here it's a very stiff design. And how good is the resolution on the encoders? So the encoders um, are essentially about better than 0.1 arc second. I think on this, they're 0.07 arc seconds per tick. Um, you know, so this, I, I believe, has 18 million counts. The, one, the 700 has 16 million counts. So here we're using Heidenheim absolute encoders. Um, and that means when the telescope wakes up, it knows where it is. Yep. With a direct drive motor, there's something called a commutation angle. It needs to wake up and figure out where the uh, where it needs to start up. And with absolute encoders, you don't need to do anything with that. If if you don't have absolute encoders, then there is a commutation that has to happen when the telescope turns on, right. which is an easy process too. But uh, it's just one less step. And and this means with absolute encoders that when you wake up, your you know your alignment to the sky to a pixel or not a pixel, but to a um, tick on the encoder accuracy so very good how quickly will it slew well we ship it um, where it slews about 15 degrees per second but it'll slew as fast as 50 degrees per second and it will accelerate at 20 degrees per second per second so in fact we can watch it do that 
here real quick. Yeah, we'll take Let's a demonstration. See. But So this would allow it to track satellites, and also if you needed to slew from one target in the sky to another on a very short notice, you can get there in a hurry. At, exactly. So when you're, when you're um, imaging, say, LEO satellites, I mean, basically the fastest I've seen this ever have to go is maybe one and a half degrees, maybe two degrees, even when you're getting cl close to the zenith. But if, you're, if you want to do fast slews, we had one customer on our CDK 700 that wanted to know how fast, if he was 180 degrees away, how quickly can he be imaging because he wanted to do gamma ray bursts. Yes, yeah, that's what I was and thinking. And we could be, it was just under, uh, or just about seven seconds that we could be, do 180 degree slew and be tracking good enough to start imaging in never, seven seconds. Never be more than seven degrees away from your, seven, seven seconds, seconds away se from yep, your target. Exactly. All right. So let's watch let's take a look at, this. at 50 degrees per second. <clears throat> So since uh, altitude is so, um, doesn't move nearly as far, we only have that set to 20 degrees per second. It can go to 50 also, but maybe you can do a, there's a longer slew. There you can see it all the way to 50. Remember, it's accelerating at 20 degrees per second per second. So it's up to full speed. <coughs> so it speed takes a couple seconds to get to, get to full, full speed. speed. Where are all the electronics for oh, the scope? Yeah, that's a good question. So <coughs> all the electronics are um, inside, the, uh, inside the, the base of the telescope. So we've got electronics for the direct drive um, derotators, two of them. We've got electronics for the direct drive motors for altitude and azimuth. Um, then we have other power supplies to, to power other, like the focusers and the dew heaters and the fans and all the other accessories that come on the telescope. So basically what you're feeding into the telescope is just a power supply and also a computer connection. That's right. You just have a Ethernet cable and a power cable to power the telescope. Now you will add probably a USB to power your cameras and other accessories. Not power them, but to talk, communicate with them. Right. And you probably would run for all your accessories, maybe an extension cord up there to power whatever accessories the customer puts on it. Now in this telescope, there are a lot of bays in here where, and this pole right here allows you to run cables through here, down, and you can run them through the mount. And they all come out the center. Um, there's a nice big hole that goes down the center and go through your pier and you can run them to your computer. And so customers, a lot of room to run all the cables you want, put power supplies in there, USB hubs if you want. There's a lot of room to put whatever you need in there to operate your observatory. I know when I think of a telescope of this size aperture and research capability, you think of them as custom instruments where you have to order all kinds of, you know, order it this way, order it that way, but this is pretty much a complete package software and everything, right? Yeah, that's a, actually a good point, um, is we wanted to make, in fact, when Plane Wave started, we wanted to make a product line. We didn't want to make custom telescopes. Anything in this size was always a custom telescope. There was, wasn't anybody making. So they're very expensive because they're custom. They take forever to get. So even if <clears throat> somebody wanted to buy um, a large telescope, the amount of time it would take to get it was uh, um, you know, a, two years probably to get a telescope this size because you're making from scratch and you're designing it. This we want to have the lead time be short. We want to bring the cost down and we want to, and we're making the same thing over and over and over again. So we're constantly, we will constantly be building these. There'll be a, a, a flow of work building these so the lead time can be six months rather than two years. And you know your product that you buy is covered. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, warranty parts there's, because we're building the same thing over and over again. And, and the software that controls these controls our 700 and controls our um, L-series mount and our other mounts. That same software applies as that develops and keeps changing, everyone can get upgrades for their product. So you have this product that's not only off the shelf, but it's supported uh, as a product line is, where these one-off telescopes, you know, it's, it's oh, this, this thing stopped working and, and it's very expensive and very time consuming to try and replace. So, and that's really, when I started Plane Wave was the concept we wanted to do. The 20 inch telescope was the first telescope we made. And I wanted the price on the website. I didn't want people to have to call up and say, oh, so how much is this? And then we get all their information. And I want them to know that, you know, the price of that telescope. So they know if it's in their range. If it, it, is, it was a product line telescope that we were making, whether we had orders or not. 
All right, you bring up a good point. I'm hardly an expert on the cost of research grade telescopes in the meter plus aperture category, but I'm thinking it's million dollar plus type instruments. What's, what's the Yes, yeah, so, so the uh, one meter is $650,000. And- uh, That's amazing. Yeah, and, and it comes essentially complete. There's little other accessory things that you can buy for it, but essentially you're set to go with software, D-Rotator, it, it's all set to go. The other important thing is the installation. Our 700, we install in not just one day, but it's a matter of hours to get it installed. The harder thing when you're we're installing the telescope is to get all the computers talking to cameras and all the drivers for cameras and domes and all of that. The telescope is up and running. We installed um, I think three telescopes in one trip, and we had them all running that first night. And the, the one meter is very similar. It's a couple more steps since it's bigger, but it'll all be set up and running that first night when you set it up. I mean, I know of some other custom telescopes uh, that were bought that took three months to install. They had to go out there and they're out there for three months installing this giant thing with this thick mirror that uh, weighs 900 pounds, <laughs> you know, and so the whole telescope, you know, goes up proportionally. Well, that brings up an interesting question. Um, does plane wave do the installation of these instruments? Yes, so we install the telescopes. The, like the 700, we have some customers that have installed themselves, and we've had some customers that have bought several of them and learned to install them. And they're actually get, going to do a couple installs for us that are out of the country. It's just more convenient for them to do it than us. Um, but for the most part, we install probably 80% of the larger telescopes, maybe 90%. All right. Well, we're kind of on the same topic. What is the expected delivery time on instruments like this? Um, so we're trying to make it six months. You know, it, it obviously depends on the backlog, um, but we're trying to ramp our production up enough so we can deliver six to eight months from time of order. That's pretty with, remarkable. With our, um, 700 we're delivering probably in three months. Really? You know, we've been as high, you know, we've had enough back orders sometimes that it was six or seven months, but we really ramped up pr production and are able to usually deliver in about three months. Mm -hmm. So this, we're trying to get it to six months. The first one, um, you know, is, is more like a year. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're building a run of five of these right now. This is the sixth one. This is the first one. We're building five more right now which you'll get to see some of them being installed in our other shop in Michigan. All right, we'll be doing that a little bit later in the yeah. video. Anything more you want to tell me while we're standing here? Because I'd like to see a little bit about the optics that are going into the scope. I know in your optical facility. Yeah, sure, and it would be kind of nice to show you inside. So uh, maybe we can rotate this around. and. And point it up. You said early on that the entire design of this telescope was sort of driven by the mirror. And we can see looking in here now that it's a very unusual shape and an unusual design. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, as I was saying, this is the, uh, the whole beginning and the, the basis of the one meter design is this mirror. We have one in the optics shop and we can go take a closer look oh, at that. Oh, let's do that. So let's look at that. Okay. Right. Okay, so here's one of our uh, one meter mirrors being figured, and um, and uh, let me introduce you to Joe Haberman over here. He's our master optician and business partner. Joe, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the optics and how you make them. Nice to meet you too, Dennis. All right. Um, before we get into some of the details of the one meter, can you tell me a little bit more about the CDK design in general? Yeah, the CDK design, it's uh, similar to a traditional Dahlkirkham. CDK stands for corrected Dahlkirkham. And uh, like the uh, traditional Dahlkirkham, it has an elliptical primary and a spherical secondary. And these are generally uh, relatively simple shapes to make in glass, uh, as opposed to more complicated designs like a, a Ricci Cratchian design. But what we've done, <clears throat> what the problem with the uh, traditional Dahlkirkham is it suffers from off axis aberrations. Um, but what we've done is we've taken the traditional design, we've modified it a bit, and we've added a sec uh, set of corrector lenses that are near the focal plane so that you get all the advantages of relatively simple optics to make and all the performance that a much more complicated system would normally deliver. 
So the design by itself has a really flat feel, doesn't need an extra feel flattener added to the system. That's correct. It comes uh, completely uh, well corrected with a flat field and uh, very small off-axis aberrations. And the design is made to cover what size detectors? Well, with the one meter, we've optimized it for a 100 millimeter imaging circle. Uh, so any detector smaller than 100 millimeters obviously works. Um, then we've also designed a focal reducer that brings that 100 millimeter field down to something around 70 millimeters. At what and focal ratio? F4 with the focal reducer. F4? F6 is the native focus uh, F ratio. All right. And, and we bring that down to F4 so that you can then take advantage of all of that light gathering ability and bring it down to a smaller camera, uh, 70 millimeter, which is still a very large camera for right. the industry today. Even your design going down from the one meter to say the 12 inch, will the 12 inch cover this 50 millimeter circle? Yeah, the 12 inch will cover the 50 millimeter circle. Uh, it won't cover much more than that. Uh, obviously with larger and larger telescopes, you can, you can take advantage of that size by getting larger and larger focal planes. The 12 and a half is optimized with just a 50 millimeter image circle. Okay, and the other telescopes in between obviously can cover those. The reason I'm saying is because a 52 millimeter circle will cover that big 16803 chip that's so popular today with many astrophotographers. Exactly, and that's why we design all of our telescopes to cover at least that chip and the bigger ones can cover more. Oh, that's great. All right, a little more detail about the mirror here. What's going on? Well, obviously you can see the light weighting that's been machined into the back. This is a polished mirror here and it's ready to be figured. It, it's already had some figuring runs done on it. Uh, it's sitting on the same exact support, or one identical to the support, that it will be sitting on in the telescope, so that it will, it behaves exactly as the way it will in the telescope. And this is the point at where we remove just a, a few microns at most, or in some cases just a few nanometers worth of glass in just the right places, so that we get the exact perfect shape we're looking for. Uh, and this is the heart of the telescope. This is the main light gathering piece of the telescope. Uh, the performance of the telescope beyond this point can only be as good as this piece of glass. And so it's very important that this piece of glass be as perfect as we can get it. Well, it gets more difficult as you start making bigger mirrors. Yeah, the, the bigger the mirror, the, it gets much more difficult. You have to remove more glass and uh, the tolerances get tighter and tighter as you get larger in aperture. All right. Now I know Rick had said earlier that the primary mirror weighs about 120 pounds and it started out as a, a regular solid disc of glass and all of this pocketing and light weighting has been machined into it and I know later on in this video we're going to visit the facility in Michigan where you're doing this work. So, Yeah, so uh, uh, the mirror started off weighing roughly uh, 200 pounds, it's maybe a little over 200 pounds and we've removed about half the glass, maybe a little more than half the glass. And uh, we, we've done this in such a way with this uh, light weighting pattern that it retains almost all of the rigidity that it had when it was a solid piece of glass, yet it weighs half as much as it did when it was before it was machined. Right. Now I know uh, we had been talking earlier about the testing of these mirrors. You've got an unusual facility here for that. Yeah, we do. Uh, we've come up with a, a, a way to test this mirror that's a little innovative. One of the things with testing a big mirror like this is it's kind of awkward to work on this mirror, then move it to some place where you can test it, and then figure out where you're going to work it, put it back, and then work it, and then you know, take, take it, it off, off and, and test, test it. it. That's uh, very uh, laborious and very risky because you know it is a delicate piece of glass. You don't want to uh, make a mistake doing that. So what we've done is. We've removed a skylight in this building, and we've put our testing apparatus up here above the ceiling so that we can work the mirror and then clean it and dry it and test it without ever removing it from the machine here. And then once we figure out where it needs more work, we can go ahead and uh, work it some more, clean it, dry it, and test it without ever having to remove it and put it back. And your test equipment is remote controlled. You don't have to actually go up on the roof and look down. That's correct. It's all controlled through a computer over here. And uh, uh, there's no need for anybody to be up there personally. All right. So that works great if the telescope were always pointed just right at the zenith. But what about testing it for other configurations when you're aimed at different altitudes? Well, that's a good point because most of the time telescopes aren't pointed directly at the zenith. And we want to make sure that they do work good no matter where they're pointed. So what we've done is we've designed this machine such that it can be tipped and it can actually, we can set up a test configuration up here 
and uh, this one is uh, 30 degrees off the horizon or 60 degrees from the zenith. And we can test and make sure that the mirror holds its shape uh, as low as uh, 30 degrees off the horizon. Yeah, um, and it, as you said, it's on an actual support that is the same that's in the telescopes. It's in the so telescope, it's going right. to perform just as if it were in a telescope. That's correct. Yeah, it's innovative stuff. Well, Joe, I want to thank you very much. I appreciate you telling me how the mirrors are made and tested. It's very educational. It's interesting stuff. My pleasure. Thank you. OK, so Joe told you about um, testing the optics, the primary mirrors, as we're manufacturing them. But there's a lot more optical testing that goes into uh, telescope making. And that's when we put the whole telescopes together. And there's several steps to uh, putting a telescope together. First, Joe will as he's manufacturing the mirror, we'll be testing it continuously until it reaches a state where we call it done. And then we take the mirror out and we have it coated. And then we mount the mirror. Um, and in telescope making, uh, that's the most delicate part of all, is when you touch the mirror, is you don't want to deform it. So we mount the mirror and we test that. And that's done in another test tunnel we have. Um, where we directly test the mirror the same way Joe tests it. Okay, so that's the primary mirror that's on itself. That's the primary mirror by itself, it, mounted in the back plate of the telescope in its mirror cell. Okay. And then we test the secondary mirrors. We do that against a match plate. And all the lenses are pre-tested um, even before we get them, but we test them when they come in. So now all the optics are tested individually. So then you put the whole telescope together, and we do it with an uncoated secondary, and we test the whole complete system um, we have a uh, horizontal test tunnel yep. in, in another room, and we can put the whole telescope in there and we can test it. If there's any residual errors in the system, we can take the secondary out and do hand figuring yep. to clean up any residual errors. Match it to the primary. Match it to the primary. Um, so, and here we have, this is something new that we have, is a vertical test tunnel. This is a... Uh, slightly bigger than one meter flat above us, optical flat, and we can test the one meter telescope in here and the 700 and the 24s. And the smaller telescopes we test in our horizontal test tunnel, just it's more convenient. But um, up until that point, the 700s and 24s uh, all had to go outside to be tested optically also through the final optical test. So you can do right a star now test. Now we with can them. do it in the daytime and <laughs> get them set up. Get them set up. And so. <clears throat> Here we have a 24 setup, and it's on an equatorial mount, so you can get it kind of centered. Right now, yep. it's not even centered under the tunnel. Right. But we go in here, and we're going to test the whole complete system. Um, and in fact, this, this one has already been matched because it's got a coded secondary in yep. it. And we're just going to do one more final test to make sure that we didn't mess anything up when we had it coded and remounted the secondary. Um, and it'll be done in here. We'll do our optical tests and make sure that it, it passes. So every telescope goes through this process. Where every step of the way, we're testing the optics. And it's you know, very simple. The last thing we want to do is ship a telescope that has an optical problem. Yeah. Um, so you know, this way, everything is pre-tested, and we know exactly what we're shipping. We keep a record of every telescope and the mirrors in every state. They're all recorded, and we've got a nice history of every optical system that ships. As it moves through the production. As it moves through the production. Yeah. You know, in addition, the 700s, um, even though they're tested in here, they all go outside too. Because the key, one of the keys to the 700 and the installation being so easy is that we know it's a working telescope. And for us to take it outside one night and just make sure everything's slewing correctly, everything's, work, everything's working together. That's then we system. create that thing after that. And then when we go to the install, you, you know you have all, you know you have a working telescope, and that, so we've never really had one that shipped, other than one that got damaged once, oh. <laughs> you know, just a little bit damaged, and we were able to fix it, but on the on site, but um, you know th that that way everything installation goes really easy. Okay. So. I know you talked a lot when we were looking at the one meter about the 700. Want to go over and take a look at that right now? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's go. So this is a 700 telescope, and we've covered this in a couple of other videos that viewers may want to look at in the past. Yeah, it's been on uh, AIC, I think a couple different AICs we did videos, yeah. and uh, 700 was featured in there. Okay. Um, Give me a quick overview of what's going yeah. on. So again, the 700 is um, like the one meter, where it has dual nasmuth focus, 
focus comes out this side, comes out the other side. Here you see it with a CCD camera on it. Um, and it's direct drive, so there's no gears. Again, you can pull it away and it'll go right back to where it was. Um, there it goes right back. You know, it can track very quickly. It's good for tracking satellites. It's good for tracking, um, you know, uh, quickly through, uh, you know, quick acquisition of targets if you want. It can salute 50 degrees per second. Um, and it's, again, a very stiff mount. This technology is really what led us to the one meter. We've, we've proven this technology. We have, um, I think, 35, about 35 of these telescopes out in the field. Wow. And, um, you know, so there are, and there's some on mountaintops, you know, where they buy arrays of telescopes, five of them up, up on Mount Hopkins. There's several in Arizona. There's going to be three or four on Mount Kent down in Australia that they're still purchasing right now. Um, anyways, so it it's, was, you know, our state-of-the-art technology was really developed here, and it went up to the one meter, and and then from there we went down to an even other mount that we can talk about. We'll see that in a after minute. This, yeah. All right. So this is a 0.7 meter, 28 inch aperture. Yep. It's an f what? It's f 6.5. F 6.5. And we now have a reducer for it that takes it down to f 4.5, and has a reasonable amount of back focus for. Uh, you know, for something that fast. So, okay. And since we were talking about the cost of the other one being rather remarkable, what's the cost on these? This is two hundred and ten thousand. Um, it now we only offer it with few silica glass because it's such a big mirror. Um, it was two hundred thousand with with the Pyrex or borosilicate. Yep. Um, but at a at a telescope this size, the uh, improvement of few silica over borosilicate is so much it's we only sell that now for two hundred and ten thousand. So and the fuse silica is very close to zero expansion. Yeah. It's a nice stiff material and it doesn't hold heat as much as say zero dur or some of the ceramics do. Um, nevertheless we still blow heat across or blow air across the front to break up any boundary layers. We do that on the one meter also. Um, so this telescope is a favorite for schools putting as a campus telescope because it has the dual Naismith ports. They can have a camera they can leave on one side all the time, and they can have an eyepiece for those public star parties they do. And then it's also great for you know, people doing science. We have one group that's doing exoplanet research, and they do photometry on one side, and they do spectroscopy on the other side. In fact, they have four telescopes feeding into one spectrograph. Um, hmm. So, and they're, they're the ones on top of Mount Hopkins, that's the Minerva project. Okay. I know there's something we didn't mention before, but looking at this telescope and realizing how compact it is, it will fit in a small size dome, I imagine. Yes, this can fit in a 12-foot dome easily, and because it's Altaz, and it's not equatorial, when you have an equatorial mount, they take up a lot, a much bigger footprint. Yeah. So here's a 0.7 meter telescope that will fit in a 12-foot dome, and our one meter telescope, since it too is Altaz, will fit in a 16-foot dome. So you can put these rather large telescopes in small domes if you want to. Obviously, you can put them in bigger domes, too, if you want to be able to have a lot of people coming. Yep. So, but, but even here, I noticed that you know, the focus point is what, maybe about four and a half feet off of the floor? Yep. So, yeah, it's, set, yeah. it's actually set to be uh, wheelchair accessible. So the, the huh, 0.7 point. meter was. We designed it specifically to do that. So this is the new L-series mount. Yes, yeah, so this is brand new. Um, this is a single fork arm Altaz and equatorial mount. It can be mounted either way. Um, it can actually even be mounted out out if that interests you. Um, and it, this, we have two different models. We have the L500, which is this one, and we have the L600, which is a little bigger. The 500 will hold our 17 inch telescope and our 20 inch telescope. The 600 will hold up to our 24 inch telescope. And uh, as I said, these are direct drive. In fact, the motor design and everything really came from all of our experience we gained in designing the motor for the 700 and then sharpening our knowledge of how to design motors and designing the one meter motors. And as we were designing that, we quickly said, oh, let's make one that's smaller. Um, and so we designed the motors for, for the L series. I know. I know we're going to see some of this out in Michigan. Yes. But you don't just design them. You manufacture these motors from the ground we up. We do. We do um, design them to fit into our specific need, and therefore it's a custom motor. So we manufacture them too. And really, we can manufacture them cheaper than we can buy them. 
um, because that's, uh, that, that's a real specialty to buy a custom made motor. So we design exactly what we want with the exact spacing and the field strength and everything we want, um, the right torque and the right voltage all to, for, to mac, match with our controller. So we design all that and to fit in our bearing and to have an axis encoder, you know, all these things. So it's all thought together, you know, even to the point of having a core graph limitation, like the 700 and the one meter, they both can turn almost two full turns. Because you know you, what you don't want to have happen is it turn 20 turns and then tear up all the cabling inside. Yeah. So it's an actual physical stop after you know uh, just short of two turns. You know and this has the, the same same thing built in. Um, this is an interesting capability of plane wave. I mean, when you stop and think about it, it might be easy to design stuff using parts that you get off the shelf from someplace, but then you'll be making compromises. You might not get exactly what you want. And where you have the capability to design and build the stuff to precisely what you you need. Yeah, you're right. And it really lends itself to that we've pulled together a, a, a big a team of people. So we've got a really good mechanical designer. Actually, we have two good mechanical designers. And you'll meet Kevin uh, later in this video. Um, and we've got a, a machine shop, people that are very good at welding, people that are good. We've got um, Dave Rowe, our CTO, who is writing most of the algorithms we're using um, and has tons of experience at designing telescopes. We have Kevin Iverson, who is a master software engineer, um, who is really the one perfecting how we control these motors. So, you know, we design the motors, we get them running, then Kevin Iverson sits there and fights with tuning them and learn, learning all the parameters of the driver using how it interacts with the motor so we can get quick fast acquisition, so we can use the capabilities of the, uh, um, of the direct drive motors. So um, it was really, you started using direct drive in the 700, and then when you went to the one meter, you started creating everything yourself, and it was a material that you learned doing that that gave you the ability to feel confident to build something like this? It, yeah, yeah, it was the fact that we started really getting comfortable at, des at designing, a, designing motors. We actually designed a couple different motors for the one meter, for the altitude axis. Um, we designed um, just different types of motors and we're trying different things and seeing what we like, see what fit into the package we had. So we have another motor that we had designed that didn't make it um, mm. in that design. So at that point we started feeling very comfortable. You know, we even, for the 700, we had different companies doing the windings for us. And then they ended up moving their production offshore, and the quality, you know, got bad. And their, uh, not just the quality, but their delivery schedules, you know, hmm. were, were unreliable. So we started winding the coils uh, ourselves again. We had started off winding them ourselves, now we're doing it again. And now we wind them for all these, and they can be custom exactly what we want. So it's just good to have the control. Oh, you know, in, in many different aspects of making telescopes, there's some things where the, the world doesn't seem to do it very well and you need to do those things yourself. And there's other things that are done well. Making lenses, there's lots of companies that make lenses at pretty good prices, so there's no reason for us to make a lens. But there is reasons for us to make mirrors. There's yeah. reason for us to machine glasses, you know, and design mounts. The nice thing about the L-series mount is it's taking the technology that was in all these bigger, more expensive, more advanced telescopes, um, well, not necessarily more advanced, that's the whole point, is we're bringing that technology uh, down to a lower price telescope mount. So this is an $18,000 mount, um, which is, there's nothing like that in the market that has, that can slew it 50 degrees per second or even 60 degrees per second, that can, um, you know, that's direct drive, that can be used equatorially or um, out as or out out, you know, the advantage of having a single fork arm. There, there was concerns about a single fork arm in the beginning, you know, as a group, as we're discussing. And we said this, remember earlier we were talking about when you design forks, yeah, that either. you're trying to get two axes to point to each other. Yeah. And that adds expense, you know, to the process. How do you yeah. get these things to align? You know, do we, ha do we need to go with the space frame? Do we need to go, well, the other thing you can do if there's smaller telescopes is have a single fork arm and size the fork correctly to hold them. So there was fear that, oh, well, people will, there's a bias against single arm forks, even if they're, even if they're designed right. And, uh, but, you know, I'd argued really hard and said, no, if we make it, we make it right, there'll be no question. 
because I've seen nice high-end mounts that are single forks, even professional ones, and you don't question the mount at all. When you see something that's right, you know it. And the so the advantage to the single fork is that I can put a 12, I can put a, 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 a 17 on here and I can put a 20 on here. I could put a 16 on here, a Mead 16 on here. I could put a Celestron 14 on here if you want it. You know, you don't have to worry about this spacing. You don't have to worry about some complicated device that could hold different tubes. This is like a German Equatorial in the sense that it, the, the great advantage is yes, yep. that you can put different things on it. This can do the same thing, but it's a fork. So you don't have Meridian flip. And, and then on top of that, you have, um, this is adjustable. This is on a dovetail, so you can get your center of mass over the center of the bearing, over the over the center of this. So, mm -hmm. um, so really has a lot of advantages of the German Equatorial without that big counterweight bar going out there, yep. without meridian flips, and its direct drive, and it's got axis encoders, um, and it slews very quickly, which right. maybe we could look at. So here's a question I yeah. didn't ask before, but yeah. now you're getting down into the smaller telescopes, into more of the amateur category. Um, your software. Is it compatible with other control systems out there like uh, ACP? Oh, right, right. So it, it's all our software is compatible with ACP and it's ASCOM compatible. You can run you know, anything that talks ASCOM, you can talk to our stuff. And we work very closely with ACP also. Yeah. The big Astronomer's compo Control Panel for those that right. don't recognize the acronym, but this is the telescope automation software. Correct, correct. Yeah. We work very closely with Maxim DL also. So our software calls Maxim DL a lot and uses it for doing plate solves and um, and we also work with like CCDAP and there's some other you know software out there too. So so anyways, anything ASCOM compatible. Um, right. we, but the other nice thing is the software that's controlling this and controlling the one meter. Um, it also controls our it controls all our telescopes. So it controls the 700, it'll control this, it'll control the one meter, it'll control our A200, and so it's one software package is now controlling everything. Good for all the scopes. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's even a version of our s software that's controlling some Celestron telescopes that Celestron's distributing, so. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for showing me everything here today, and I know this is a major part of the plane wave operation, but there's even more, and for that, we need to go to Michigan. I'm with Kevin Ayat, head of Plane Waves Operations in Michigan. You do a lot of the manufacturing here of the telescope parts before they head off to California. That's correct. Uh, first, I'd like to say welcome to Michigan. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, that's right. Uh, so here in Michigan, we do all of the machining, uh, fabrication, and manufacturing for all of Plane Wave Instruments products. Um, we do uh, all of the assembly of our larger telescopes, the 700 and the 1 meters, uh, as well as the assembly and testing of our Ascension 200 mounts. Uh, our new L series mounts uh, will all be assembled uh, and tested here as well. Um, and our rotating focusers are all built here in Michigan. All right. so, um, so you're essentially starting here with raw materials, creating all the parts, assembling the telescopes, and on the larger ones, you're shipping assembled telescopes off to California where the optics are installed and finally tested. That's correct. Uh, all of the parts uh, that are machined here for the larger telescopes uh, are assembled uh, into the finished product, what you see back here. Um, they're tested mechanically and electrically um, before being broken down and sent to our facility in California. Uh, to have the optics installed uh, and all the optical testing and final checks uh, done before they're shipped off to the customer. Okay, and I think what's really interesting here is a lot of the parts that you're assembling into these telescopes, even things like your motors, especially the motors on the bigger scopes, you're building those, you're designing and building them here. They're not just parts that you're ordering from some other company and assembling in. Right, that's right. The, uh, everything from the motors, uh, we design uh, all of the magnetic field uh, analysis. Uh, we wind the coils, we make the forms, uh, we populate the magnets, we uh, phase them, test them uh, from the ground up. So we'll get so. to take a look at a little, little bit of that stuff Absolutely. in a few minutes. But there's something else that you do here that I find really fascinating. When we were in California, we were looking at the one meter mirror, and we could see that it had all been machined. And they were saying that you do that here. So it's one thing to machine metal, it's another to machine glass. I'd like you to tell me a little bit more about that. That's right. So the glass machining is a process uh, that's, that's not new, of course. There, there are uh, large companies that produce uh, 
mirrors that you can go to. Right. However, we found that very cumbersome to work with these very large companies, uh, not only from an aspect of, of getting what we need from them, but you know, getting a price that's acceptable for professional and amateur uh, type telescopes. This market. In this market, exactly. Yeah. All right. So we very quickly learned that we had to uh, bring this technology in-house and do this ourselves to really control the process. And what I find fascinating is that you've taught yourself how to do this. That's right. Uh, through trial and error and some time and a little bit of bits and pieces here and there and thankfully very, very little broken glass, <laughs> okay. uh, we, we were able to uh, nail down a process, develop the tooling, design the equipment uh, that's necessary to produce up to and including our, our one meter mirrors for our telescopes. You've got an example of the mirror here. Want to take a look at this? I do, absolutely. All right, let's take a look. So this is a machined one meter blank for our CDK 1000. We're looking at the back side right now. This is all of the light weighting. There's several operations that go into this. Uh, the mirror comes in, uh, it's fused silica, comes from Corning, New York has a 42 inch diameter disc that's just flat on both sides uh -huh. and weighs roughly 300 pounds. And through the light weighting and the curve generating leaves our machine at just over 100 pounds. Wow, so all of these pockets, everything we're looking at here is not cast into the glass but rather machined into it just as if you started with a block of metal and machined into it. Precisely. That's an amazing process. We're gonna see a little bit into that in a minute, aren't we? Yes. All right, that's really nice. Well listen, how about giving me a little bit of the tour of the facilities here? That sounds great. Let's uh, put your safety glasses on and let's go. Okay. All right. This is one of our general assembly areas. A lot of the things go on that go into the telescopes over in here. A lot of the smaller sub-assemblies will get manufactured and assembled here before then they're taken over to the larger assembly and built into, in, the, into the final instruments. Exactly. Uh, we have several things going on here at the moment. We have uh, rotating focusers being leveled out and built. We've got electronics panels for uh, CDK-1000 being built right now. Over here we have the shell for one of our CDK-1000 altitude motors getting ready to be populated with its magnets and coils. We've got uh, CDK-700 motor being built and then over here we also have a one of our Ascension A200 mounts uh, being final tested before it goes off to a customer. Ready to go. All right, so you have all parts out here and you just put them into the assemblies. That's right. What you'll see here is, is a fraction of the parts that are required to build one of these telescopes. Everything from the mirror cell components to the motors to the optical tube components the truss poles, everything necessary to manufacture one of these telescopes from beginning to end. All right, so what do we have here? This is the machine uh, that Plane Wave has purchased uh, specifically for machining our glass blanks. This is a standard, you know, quote unquote, off the shelf machine. However, it's been tailored uh, by Planeway specifically for machining our glass blanks. And you've got a one meter blank in here right now that's been partially machined. That's correct. So we can see some of the light weighting that's been done? That's right. This blank is about 80% complete. The front side has already been generated. The back side has already been light weighted. Uh, currently, the operation going on is the edge profile is being put on it. All right, so what do we have here? So this is a torsion box for one of our one meter telescopes. Uh, this is uh, in process of being welded right now. It's already been assembled and tack welded together. And the next step that he's already started is doing all the seam welding for finishing it all up. Uh, now this starts as pieces that you said were laser cut? That's right. Most of this comes in uh, as laser cut pieces uh, and then is assembled up. Uh, one of the great technologies of this is that it basically registers itself and 
uh, we're able to put it together and, and not have to do a lot of measuring and, and setups and, and things like that. So uh, it makes it uh, very easy to assemble, very efficient, uh, which always helps uh, in the cost of our products. And, uh, and of course it looks great. Yeah. So you machine some of the pieces that are in here. I can see this. That's right. There's actually, in this particular assembly, there's only two machine components in this entire assembly. All right, now we're seeing this upside down. In California, where we saw the assembled telescope, this is the piece from the other side that had those space frame tubes going up for the fork. That's right, that's right. And these end cavities here, this is where all of the electronics, the motor drives, yep. uh, everything is stored uh, for running the telescope. That's really nice. Yeah, and one thing that I wanted to mention with all of, uh, not only this one meter torsion box that you're seeing here, but all of our fork weldments for the one meter, the CDK 700, and our new L mount. The L series. They're all manufactured from stainless steel. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult uh, and certainly more expensive uh, due to the material, uh, but they're, they'll never rust, you'll never see any corrosion, you won't never see a rust streak uh, going down the side of your telescope. Yes, especially these instruments being outside and everything. Absolutely. I know what it can be like. You have a steel screw in a piece, telescope outside for a couple of years, you go to remove the screw, it's all rusted in place. Exactly. Uh, you definitely don't want to run into that problem if there's ever any issues with the telescope. There's access covers. You need to be able to get those things off to get at uh, you, all of the various things. And, you don't uh, want a rusted screw. You don't want a rusted screw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's really nice. All right, what next? So over here, uh, this is one of our milling departments. Uh, we have two CNC mills that uh, run various components for the telescopes. Uh, currently in this machine, he's running, uh, this is a center hub for an M3 unit for our one meter. Right. The M3 was the, the mirror in the middle that could flip between the two Naismith ports. That's right, the M3 is the flat in the center that, yep. that rotates to, uh, to select which port is being used. All right. So you've got some of the machining has obviously been done. Yep, this is operation one. It's already been turned over in the turning center, which we'll go to shortly. Uh, and then comes over to this uh, side of the shop to have the uh, light weighting pockets put in and all of the holes and uh, various things to attach the motors and uh, cables and whatnot. So this started out in a CNC lathe. That's correct. If you'd like, let's go over and take a look. Let's see what they look like. So this is one of our CNC lathes. Currently in the machine is one of our CCD spacers, uh, as you can see here. Might, might not be as familiar to most, but <laughs> I certainly recognize it. Uh, one of the great things about these types of machines is that you have all of the tools that you need to produce that part. In uh, one right operation, yeah. In one operation, uh, right here in the machine, loaded up, ready to go. So, so once you've run your first part and proven out your program and all of your tools, uh, you can just load the raw material in and press cycle start. And uh, assuming all things go well, you'll end up with a finished part. Well, it's starting to get a little noisy in here. I want to thank you for showing me all of the manufacturing, but I know you do a lot more than just oversee the construction of these telescopes. You've got a lot of the involvement with the designing. Yes, of course. And I'd love to take you up front and show you a few of those things. Let's take a look at some of it. Great. Yeah, come on in and have a look. All right. So one of my largest roles here at Plane Wave uh, is doing the design and engineering of our products, mechanically and in some ways electrically. A lot of the panel wiring, um, drive selection, things like that. Uh, are, are some of my responsibilities. Uh, what I've brought up here for you to take a look at today uh, is the new L series of mounts uh, that we've been working on designing at Plane Wave. And uh, really what I've been responsible for for this is uh, Rick and I conceptualized this uh, some point many months ago and through process of iterating and and everything, we really came up with uh, what we feel is a great idea uh, for this L-series mount. As a matter of fact, in California, we saw the L-mount set up, and Rick mentioned that it could be used both as altazimuth, which is the way it was there, and you've got it on the screen here as an equatorial. That's right. It's been designed for both, uh, as you say, altaz and equatorial. 
Uh, it has even been designed to go completely horizontal and be used in an alt-alt configuration, uh, which tends to be very popular uh, for our aerospace type customers. Satellite tracking. Satellite tracking and uh, uh, yeah. space debris tracking, exactly. It's an interesting concept. The other thing that Rick said is it really, it was the trickle down technology from the one meter that allowed you to guys to design this. Um, and he said the confidence that you gained in, in building and designing the motors made you feel that you could turn out something that would work in this type of a design. That's right. Uh, we've been able to take everything that we've developed and designed uh, on the one meter telescope, and shrink that down into a mount this size. Uh, th there's so much that we've learned that uh, we, we felt should really be brought down and, and shared with uh, more of our amateur market. And Rick mentioned that this process of designing it was really able to keep the cost down and make it something that was affordable in the amateur market. That's right. Because we're able to design all of these things within a design environment like SolidWorks, we're able to predict uh, the amount of material that we're going to need. Uh, the motors were very accurately able to predict their behavior. Uh, so we have the confidence to design them and build them and we have a very high probability of getting it correct the first time around. And that's able to save us costs in manufacturing, the design costs, uh, and we're able to pass that along to the customers. Something that really strikes me from seeing not only the operation in California, but especially here, is that other than nuts and bolts and a few bearings perhaps, virtually everything in these telescopes is being manufactured by you, particularly here. I mean, you're designing the parts, you're designing the motors, and then you're building them. I mean, that must give you an enormous advantage in a lot of ways. It does. It, it gives us complete flexibility. If, if there's an area that we feel will be better for some certain reason, we don't have to live by anyone else's standards or constraints. Uh, we can simply design it how we feel it needs to be designed and, and roll with it. Um, and another great thing of having all of the manufacturing capability in-house is that we have the freedom to try things too. Uh, there are many, many examples uh, throughout products in our company where uh, there were an evolution of stages. Uh, we've went through several design iterations to really get what we need. And uh, being able to take that from design out to our machine shop, have it made, physically get it in your hands and feel how things are gonna feel, and see how they function and operate uh, really makes our products, in, in my opinion, the best. And it also gives you control over the costs in many respects. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to manufacture these things ourselves uh, cut out many, many stages, uh, many changing of hands that parts would generally have to take. Uh, and at each stage, having them marked up and um, you know, thus increasing the cost of, of the final product. Plus, we're able to really drill in and adjust our procedures uh, where we're machining. If there's things that are tighter tolerance, we pay attention to those. If there's things that uh, can have a little bit looser tolerance, we don't have to worry about uh, sections there. So we're able to cut cost out of uh, each and every part uh, and component that's on the telescope. Uh, and overall, that uh, just gives us uh, a lot of control. Yeah. As you know, I, I said to Rick in California, I'm not an expert on uh, the cost of research grade instruments, but when we were looking at the one meter, uh, frankly, I was rather shocked when he told me that the entire telescope is $650,000. I mean, that's out of the average amateur's range, but it, it seems like a fraction of the cost of equivalent instrumentation that might be out there. That's right, and that's a goal that we had set from the very beginning. Uh, was we wanted to be extremely conscious of the overall cost of this product in order to get it into the hands uh, to more uh, individuals, organizations, institutions uh, by having the cost lower. Um, and, and obviously it, the only way we were able to do that is by having control over all of these factors, by machining in-house, doing the glass machining in-house, all of the design, all of the uh, product development, research and development, uh, all the way down to uh, our, our glass um, polishing and figuring capabilities uh, that you saw out yeah. in California. Yeah, everything's done by plane wave. That's right. It's really impressive.
Well, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for showing me around here today. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure, absolutely. All right. I hope viewers have enjoyed this unique opportunity to see plane wave instruments in the flesh. Not only their telescopes, but some of the people and the procedures that are used to make them. If people want more information about any of Plane Wave's equipment, they can go to their website, www.planewave.com.